Hi, this is Larissa Labre and Daphne Cabrera reporting for the Women of Color or the WOC Connect Club at Westboro High School. Today, we will be listening in on a conversation with some of the members on a few discussion questions and statements. The WOC Connect Club initially started last spring on the Chico Project organization based in Boston, held a leadership workshop at the high school. Westboro students decided to create its own chapter that provides a community and safe space for girls of color to make them feel heard, empowered, and supported. The topics we will hear today are the development and validation of the colors and scale, how does living in a predominantly white town play a role in a simulation, and the perspective of a Latina immigrant in high school. Thank you for joining us for the WOC Connect Club first broadcast conversation. This is Larissa Labre and Daphne Cabrera reporting for the WOC Connect Club from Studio 33 at Westboro TV. Hi, my name is Veronica. I go to Westboro High School and I'm in 10th grade and I'm unapologetically a black woman. <laughs> My name is Daphne Cabrera. I'm a senior here at the high school. I'm half Brazilian and half Ecuadorian. And one of my favorite activities that I like doing at the high school is cheerleading. Hi, my name is Mary Carmen. I'm a sophomore at Westboro High School and I'm fully Guatemalan. And my favorite activity to do at the high school is also cheerleading. Hi, I'm Aisha. Um, I am a Muslim uh, Arab woman and I am a sophomore at Westboro High School. My name is Kathleen Stoker. I'm an English and journalism teacher at the high school. And one of my favorite activities I like to do is advise the Lobby Observer, our online school newspaper. My name is Larissa Labre, and uh, I'm a senior here at Westboro High School, and I'm, I'm fr I was born in Brazil, and I'm a devout Christian. <laughs> Okay, so I just wanted to jump into the first topic, which is the development and validation of the colorism scale. So for me, I can just recognize that one of the manifestations of the legacy of slavery is colorism because it's completely penetrated my community. And even when talking to you guys, I can notice that it penetrates into a lot of our other minority communities when it comes to comparing ourselves or making disguised jokes when it comes to the color of our skin and whether it's darker or lighter because if you do have a lighter skin tone then it seems it's deemed as better and it's basically still validating like the white man in a way which but what are your thoughts on that um i personally have seen it a lot and like um even my culture or just like in general in like asia and african culture seen a lot that like your skin tone being a little bit lighter etc is valued more and that is, as Veronica said, part of the colorism. Yeah. yeah, I would say definitely, I think Mary could agree that in the Hispanic community, when you're seen as like a lighter tan, that is valued more than if you're a darker skin tone. Yes, I think it also comes down to beauty as well, because obviously when growing up, you didn't necessarily see yourselves for, I can say at least Disney princesses, most of them were always white, and then when you look at your own skin color and you're like, oh, I'm not even close to that, it's like, oh damn, am I beautiful as they are, or whatnot, you know, but yeah. yeah. Do you guys have anything else to say on that? I agree on that, like features, like making it seem like, you know, like, 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 tiny lips or something like that or like just like I feel like for the Hispanic community more like Spanish looking with colored eyes specifically like everybody thinks those are beautiful and they are beautiful but it's just like very much like more European style mm -hmm. you could say mm -hmm. um in Brazil like I have a lot of cousins of color so I could see like the treatment like you know they would treat me better than they would my like my cousins of color and that really affect me like throughout my life because one of my like my best friends she, she's black and then any, any time we were together like how are you guys friends or like are you guys really cousins like they mm -hmm. ask that kind of questions and I never understood as a kid you know yeah, uh, yeah. I kind of went through the same thing as because my brother's darker than me mm -hmm. as he got more of like the indigenous side of the color yeah. uh, and I feel like every time I'm out with him that they just like I just get like these weird looks, this vibe that people just don't feel like welcome him as much as he's much darker than I am. And I just feel like they're just like looking at him, like just like disrespecting him and judging him. And I obviously it's my twin brother, so I feel disrespected and judged too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely a huge thing with my parents. Um, my dad has several indigenous features from Ecuador. So he is a dark tan, whereas my mom, she's, she's like pale. 
And so whenever we, we go out, whether it's to a store or anything, my dad could be at talking to the to the employee and they'll kind of disregard him and start talking to my mom in English because they think that he doesn't know English or yeah, they just, I guess, they start talking to her because of her complexion. And yet the hypocrisy here is for those of us who identify as white, we, or the messages I was always brought up with is, well, you need to get a tan. Right? Yes, always, yeah. always. So the, it's, it's I, funny. I say I, irony and hypocrisy, yeah. right? And yeah. what is that standard of beauty you touched upon at yeah, Veronica? Colorism is more of like a manifestation of slavery, mm -hmm. in my opinion, mm -hmm. that is perpetrated into minority communities and other minority communities, you know? Right. But then when you talk about black fishing, which I've seen a lot on Instagram, it's yeah. funny because even I'd be that? at camp. For those who don't know. <laughs> <laughs> black fishing is basically you pretending to look more black or mm -hmm. have more Afrocentric features, any features that aren't usually European. Mm -hmm. So basically there were people that were getting tans to the point where you would have thought they were a black person, but they were actually white. Interesting. So yeah, yeah, it's very funny. Like that's why a lot of people say sometimes women of color are fetishized because they like mm -hmm. to see our features on white women. But then when it comes to those features on us, it's like, oh, no, it's, you don't want that, yeah. you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. I just, like, I totally um, relate to that a lot because, like, the darker hair, the more, the thicker hair, thicker eyebrows, all that, that's really appreciated when it's on a white woman. For example, Kylie Kardashian and all yeah. those, like... Um, Their BBLs. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> all those, like, beauty influencers, you see these, like, traits that are seen... Um, originally that are from like ethnic background um, your features and all that you you see that on a white woman and it's more appreciated but when it's a natural feature um, on somebody who is not white it's less appreciated mm -hmm. yeah yeah most definitely and I think even the government knows <coughs> that in a book Excuse I was me. reading about it talked about how they know that if there's divide in the communities they're conquering mm -hmm. then it'll just be easier to conquer and unfortunately, I feel like colorism is something that divides minority communities because a lot of people talk about, for example, like, oh, black lives matter. But for example, the black community is so teared apart and divided, for example, you know, so it's like, how are we supposed to sit against this battle of white and black right. when we can even unite together? And it's unfortunate that minority communities divide over these things, you know. Our next topic is how does living in a predominantly white town play a role in assimilation? Yeah, so assimilation is essentially the process in which individuals and uh, groups of differing ethnic heritage are absorbed into the dominant culture of a society. And so in, the, in, in, in U.S. history, we've seen both force and voluntary but pressured assimilation. And so with my experience um, living in Westboro, it was impossible for me to reject pressure to assimilate yeah. Which, in short term, which in short term had caused me to kind of oversee the values of my culture and act the way that my culture acts. And so I want to address that, um, that of course, to an extent, I believe assimilation is necessary. However, growing up here in this town, I found that it was easier to kind of disguise my Latino background because I felt more comfortable being a part of a society and kind of no longer feeling like, like an outsider. And um, it really came down to all parts of it. And so I couldn't bring my traditional foods to, you know, lunch without students feeling or staring because it was viewed as like strange. And I couldn't, you know, look the way I did without white students commenting on it or viewing it as again strange. I couldn't speak um, Spanish or Portuguese to the other two or three Latinos in my grade because if someone heard that again, it would be viewed as strange. And so essentially I lost a huge part of myself growing up in fear that st students would comment, in which they did, um, yeah. so yeah. Yeah, definitely, I can definitely relate to you. Even when I moved here, um, <laughs> actually, not a lot of people know this, when I moved here, I looked at the class and I'm like, everyone's white, but this mm -hmm. was in second grade, so I didn't really notice, but that day I was like crying to my dad, I couldn't tell him why, but it just felt strange. I felt so different from everyone else. I never told like, my dad, that's why I was actually crying, because at that age, mm. I didn't realize what I was crying about, but mm. definitely, because obviously our parents say, like, oh, yeah, you need to, like, stand out and whatnot, but when exactly. standing out feels like you're completely isolated from mm -hmm. majority, now you're like, I need to fit in, and I want to, like, conform and, like, be together and relate about the same things as them as well, you know? Yeah, um, 
what's it called? Uh, I've lived here like literally since I was a baby, so mm. I really never got to really experience like Daphne. Where do you live? Yeah, I I moved here from Worcester. Exactly. Yeah, yeah Worcester. exactly. You where do you live? I lived in Arlington, and then before that, I lived in Brockton. And Brockton, my whole class was black. Exactly. So, you know. so it's just like I've never really had like that experience of like actually trying to like meet my culture. Right when I was younger, I like was very like obviously my parents didn't know how to speak English or any. They were not American, you mm -hmm. know. And I always grew up with that, like, because I, I was like my parents didn't know any English, so I only knew Spanish and like only knew my culture for a while. But once I started school and started learning English. I just like, I would hide being Hispanic because I would be very like ashamed. Like I'd be like, I would like sometimes be like, why was I born this? Like, why was I born Hispanic? Like I was just, just it was just like parts like that I wasn't proud of being Hispanic because of how I grew up because I saw so many like white, I, white kids a lot growing up. So it's just like, I wanted to be like them and I wanted my parents to be white. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, I was going to add on to the point where it's like um, you want to fit in and that you find comfort and not not standing out and being different. And I feel like I kind of um, experienced both sides of that. So before I put on hijab, like um, I feel like I really wanted to wear the same clothes as other girls or do act the same way, etc. And all of a sudden, now that I started wearing hijab, it's like I couldn't hide anymore as much because it's something that's so apparent and mm -hmm. you can automatically, yeah. you can make your own assumptions, you can have your own background and uh, apply it onto who I am when it's probably not the same thing. And so after I wore the hijab, I feel like I started noticing that I was able to find comfort in who I really mm -hmm. wanted to be and who I could become. And so... Um, because it's something that's so apparent, yourself. yeah, it allows me to be more yeah. myself. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. How old were you when you... So I put my hijab on in sixth grade. It was like in the middle of the year. It was um, April. And so I just walked in all of a sudden. And of course, people are going to be a little bit confused because mm -hmm. I was once showing my hair, showing everything. Right. You couldn't really differentiate me as much because I tried so hard to fit in. And then now all of a sudden, I can't do that as, as swiftly. And mm -hmm. it's a little bit harder to... Uh, find myself fitting in as much specifically like you know like in sixth grade we are not really taught like you know all about that so I know mm -hmm. especially parents like white parents don't teach their kids anything about that so obviously they're gonna be like it's like watching an alien walk into a room mm -hmm. so yeah, it's like that's what they view it as yeah, yeah. it's yeah, just I I, sorry no yeah, well, I had like a short experience like it's kind of different but when I first walked in and then People expecting me to talk or like when they ask questions in class and I wouldn't say anything. They will literally look at me as an alien like, what do you mean? Not everyone in the world speaks English. You know what I'm saying? I was like mm -hmm. so confused and didn't really know what to do. So I kind of learned some kind of things when I first started like learning English. Like um, Miss Corley is not here, but she knows I will like beg her like, hey, is there any way that I can do like anything that I can do to lose my accent so mm -hmm. I can sound more like them and then they will like judge me or keep like asking asking like inconvenient questions, you know? Yeah. So that's pretty much what I can relate to. Yeah, and, uh, most definitely. Is there something that you wished um, looking back or even now as high schoolers that the you wish that either the teachers, educators could have or would have or should have said or supported in a certain way or wished that there was more talk of diversity representation within the classroom? I feel like for me, like uh, like right now, Black History Month is passing right now. Mm -hmm. I feel like we could actually, as a school, actually do something about it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, celebrate it in schools. Mm -hmm. And for like a Hispanic heritage, I think that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. We could, could, I didn't even know there mm -hmm. was a month they, about that. Yeah, growing up, they it's not spoken upon in school. You're talking about Black History Month? Black, Black History Month like, and um, a Hispanic Heritage Month. Yeah, Both of them go untouched, right, yeah. unspoken mm -hmm. in school. Yeah. So. I feel like for those types of uh, for those types of, like, especially for people mm -hmm. uh, people of color and people that have culture, uh, I feel like that should be embraced in mm -hmm. school. Most definitely. Because we see, like, what, we 
we, they put outside like little like turkeys for Thanksgiving and stuff like that and like little snowflakes right. for school. What about like those like stuff for the, the mm-hmm. type of the exactly. month? Exactly. And yeah, I think that's definitely. where feeling uncomfortable comes into play when we're growing up because we don't see our cultures and kind of like yeah. mm-hmm. people of our color celebrated. Yeah. So we kind of feel strange. We feel like outsiders because yeah. it's not what's I guess valued yeah. in our society. Also mm-hmm. to add on that, I'm wondering if you guys have seen on TikTok like cultural day where people dress up in yes. their oh, yeah. and clothing. The, yeah. mm-hmm. And I was just talking, I think, was I talking with you? Yeah, we were, you were talking, talking about, about how yeah. we wish yeah. our school would do something yeah. like that. Yeah. But, yeah, but for so many years, I've never really had them do anything mm-hmm. to um, show representation to like the minority students, mm-hmm. even if they say they want to advocate for us. Right. Um, it's not really shown in examples like that but when you talk about teachers I actually mm-hmm. had a teacher in Mill Pond when we were reading a book about segregation he actually called me and talked to me he's like oh does it make you feel uncomfortable and I couldn't really answer the mm. question I told him no but I was crying because mm. I felt uncomfortable but yeah. I was like how can I tell him oh yeah I don't so want hard. you to read that book and I don't want people to look at me while you're reading that book but mm-hmm. yeah. then I'm like you know I don't want to take away from the curriculum if I'm the only person. So I'm like, yeah, like, you can read it. And that's you know? But I was too. still crying. So he, he knew right. what I was feeling. But I was so young at the time. But Like, when yeah. when is it, like, history? And when is it, like, more personal, you know? So that they mm-hmm. need to, I think that something that's missing is noticing that difference and being able to differentiate the two and teaching students that certain things are going to affect certain people differently. Mm-hmm. And it's going to, some people are going to take it more personally based on their experiences. And so, of course, we can't hide history and, like, not teach it to other people because that's part of the problem, too. Mm -hmm. But also making sure that we're taking an accountability that me and you are not the same and we don't have the same experiences. So one story is going to affect me differently than it is going to affect you. Mm -hmm. But they could definitely do more advocacy when it comes to younger kids because they are not completely aware of racism, but I'm sure they feel it, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So, Mm -hmm. like, I'm happy. Yeah, I'm still happy Mr. Soleil came to me, even (laughs) though it was a tough conversation. But Mm -hmm. I feel like just protecting the younger generation so Mm -hmm. they know that these feelings they're feeling, it's not just like out of the blue. It's not weird, you know? I remember uh, when I would go out with my family, um, it's like I know, like even like like right now, like everything started to get more diverse. But just back then, I would like going out in public, I'd feel like... I would get protective. Like, you know, I remember Mm -hmm. like also just right now I took a trip to down to the like the south. To Texas? Yeah. Yeah. And I went to I went to a lot of states where there was a lot of white people. Like I've said, (laughs) I think (laughs) Westboro is a lot of white people. You should go down there and see. Like south it's bad. And (laughs) I I remember going to this restaurant and I felt the need to talk English. Because they were just looking at us, and it was just white people. And I said, I started talking in English. And they were just like, Staring. yeah, they're yeah. like, wow. Because like, I don't have an accent uh, speaking English. Because right. as yeah. like, even though it's my second language, I learned it at a really young age. That's yeah. why I don't have an accent. But it's just like, you usually expect Hispanics people to be like, to have a heavy accent when it's just like English. I mean, yeah, to English. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, I only spoke English to make sure that they know that I'm hearing what they're saying about us. Some of the, some of the reasons like my friends like me is because of the way I am and it's different from how I used to be. Mm-hmm. Cuz before of course I'm sure when you're conforming to like everyone else and trying to absorb their culture, it makes you insecure and you don't really know who you are, you know. Exactly, yeah. mm-hmm. And it's hard to attract like authentic friends when it happens mm-hmm. cuz now you just have friends that you're pretending to bond over about specific things, you know? Yeah, and I was going to, I'm going to talk about this later on a little bit more, but, like, it kind of creates that, like, identity crisis because you're, <laughs> yeah. you're definitely not yourself, and when you're not yourself, you're not authentic, and you're not, you don't, you can't d- really find out who you actually are because you're completely masking it, trying to, like, fit into society and stuff, and so I, like, completely agree with uh, Veronica that, like, I've found that, like, people will like you more when you're acting, like, your normal yeah. self mm-hmm. or your true self when you're just like mixing in and putting um forcing yourself to act a certain way that's not who you actually are mm-hmm. it just makes it seem more fake uh-huh. the perspective of a latina immigrant in high school uh, as a reminder i immigrated from brazil like over three years ago and i wanted to share a little bit about my experience how it was like in westboro high or I also went to a high school in California. And I, I wanted to share you guys how it was. And my first impression that I had was like, it was very complicated. 
to enroll at the school, as like as an immigrant. Illegal or not illegal, it doesn't matter. It's very complicated to enroll. And the, the lack of resources for me and my family, because all of us, we didn't speak English, you know. So a lot of the people, wh while we there, like they were very like rude to us. They didn't really have patience. And like the lack of prepare, pre preparement from the school. And then like, it makes me wonder how, um, like there are so many immigrants nowadays here in the US and we make up more than a quarter of the school population and our needs is still invisible, you know? Like, and when I actually started school here in Westboro, I had a hard time in my classes or like to fit in and, and all that. But for the first year, I was uh, actually like kind of excluded from everyone. In the ESL park is pretty much just in the first floor. It's Miss Coelho, Miss, Miss, like, you know, mm -hmm. you know, around where. And I felt kind of like, I felt so lost and I felt like we didn't have preparement from the teachers and like, which is not their fault. They, they kind of like overwhelmed because there's a lot of us and they don't really know what to do. You know, it's a very like hard job. And I think they, they could put more, like the school itself, put more effort into it, you know? And then from the students, I felt like we were very, I was very judged and then when I actually started getting to the like, you know, learning English and getting there and, and starting to have friends, they were like, they were Americans. They were asking me a lot of like inconvenient questions such as they didn't even know I, I immigrated here, some of them. So they were like, oh, imagine those like, some parents come here, they don't know English and they bring their kids here. But like, do you really think we hear like as a kid, uh, I'm 14, I live in my home country where I, I grow up and then everything I do here sounds strange, is strange for everyone. Do you really think I'm comfortable being here and it was a choice? As a minor, we don't really have a choice if we sh we want to be here or not, you know? So they were like, oh, why would I even come here? Because a lot of people don't come here because they really want to, but they're really struggling. Mm -hmm. And I think they should be more, um, I don't know, think more yeah, about I understand. Yeah, yeah, understand. I understand. I get what you're saying, because there's opportunities here in America, you yeah. know, but a lot of white people have privilege and they don't realize how how much they they yeah. really do have here, you know? I think they just don't, like, they see us, like, why would they give up everything and come here, you know? Like, exactly. like they don't understand the situation yeah. back home. And the thing is, too, like, it's different because they were they were born here or they mm -hmm. were they were just given that thing. Um, whereas, like, no parent is going to bring their child here unless they see that they're going to have a better future here. There's, yeah. And th that's to answer their question. Like, that's why they would leave everything because yeah. mm -hmm. their child's future is, they're, they're given an opportunity yeah, to make exactly. it the oh, yeah. best. <laughs> also for like even without bringing children here sometimes people just move here to send money back home mm -hmm. uh, just to support their family because here money in America is more value for example Guatemala my, my parents send money over there for my like my family members that can't afford medical like mm -hmm. stuff and stuff yeah, and like same. that so it's like they came here to support their family back there they sacrifice yeah. their home to come here to help their family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trust me, my parents tell me all the time they want to go back. Yeah, but it's mm -hmm. part of the American uh, dream, from, all that money, you know? Exactly. And from the school, I've seen a lot of complaints such as like, oh, but your parents like never call here, or never want to really know, like, you know, when you miss school or something is happening. But imagine as someone that doesn't speak English to call the school. Sometimes I had to be dismissed, like to go to the doctor or something. And I was like, dad, you have to call the school. I was like, what am I going to say, you know? Right. And then th like, how am I going to even explain that to the, you know, to the, to the staff of the school. Mm -hmm. And also in the beginning, I didn't know any English. And like my parents also didn't. So it was, I had to do everything by myself. Mm -hmm you know, figure out uh, what bus I have to go to, figure out like how I'm gonna get to classes. The thing is that like, you guys can still like ask like people, oh, where, where is it? I can't, yeah. I just have to figure out things by myself. And it's very embarrassing when you wanna like speak in English and it just doesn't come out, doesn't mm -hmm. come out right. Mm -hmm. And all the time you just like, I remember in the beginning I was like, I'm so sorry that my English is so bad, I will keep like, being sorry mm -hmm. and yeah then and it's, that's the thing that really upsets me the most is that people feel the need to apologize exactly. uh, that they can't yeah, but it's not your like it's not something yeah. that you're like purposefully doing or it's just like it's out of your control too and yeah. then like as you a lot of people cannot feel, like a lot of us don't feel welcome in the school like I'm lucky that I'm a very friendly person 
So I got into, you know, get to know people and everything. But I see a lot of people that just, like, literally hide themselves. So don't want anyone to notice them. And they, it kind of affects the English, too. Because the way I learned English was when I forced myself to communicate. Right. And then I think the, the school should be more prepared. And the students should, like like also know better on how to treat those kind of people because we usually he not here because we really want to yeah, yeah. but yeah. i gotta give you props on learning a whole yeah. language because listen yeah. i've taken spanish for what how many years <laughs> and i can only say like a few sentences <laughs> 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 no and uh, like um, usually like in latino <coughs> families my dad they usually expects a lot from me since he's here and he's working a lot like i think i learned english in like six months and he went like oh you took too long or like, you know, he expect me to work and go to school and do things like perfectly, you know? Like, sometimes they expect me to do as good as someone that was born here, mm -hmm. and which is like almost impossible, you yeah. know? Yeah, I guess you have to also think about like how they were raised. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's different mm -hmm. from over there than here too. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I get the English part. I was in like ESL when I was younger. Uh, because obviously English is not my first language and I've tried so hard to learn English. I get that I get yeah. that struggle because I thought that my English was bad. And honestly mm -hmm. I don't care now if my English isn't good or anything like that because like obviously now I can communicate more much better than like I did like when I was younger. But I tried so hard to get out of those classes to the point where some words in Spanish that I used to know when I was younger I don't care. I can't even pronounce them. Mm -hmm. That's like that's like a, like I'm so ashamed that I forced myself to know English that I forgot my first language. Mm -hmm. And I can sympathize with you that sometimes it is difficult to explain to Americans like a task, like us task, like being having to translate to your parents. Yeah. So that's something that I've talked about with you guys that um, I've I've spent like my entire I guess childhood and in high school as well translating for my parents. Mm -hmm whether it's like government documents or stuff for work or stuff from school. Um, I've al it's always been like my job, especially as like the oldest in my family to be able to do that. No, and sometimes like when I, when I learn English, like, okay, I learned, but I'm learning every day because I've been here for three years. So every day I learn new things. And I think sometimes like we are too hard on ourselves, but we have to remember that we like, we are a whole different culture, you know, mm -hmm. like we, we are not, the, the language is different and the people are different and we should be like kind of easier on ourselves sometimes yeah. you know i was gonna say definitely agree to go gentle on yourself yeah. the courage that and i'll stick with just your story mm -hmm. for now larissa and uh, having been your teacher it's been an honor um i think my mindset is how amazing that you're learning two languages when often I do see, whether it's anywhere from colleagues to fellow people who identify as white, I have this frustration or this indignation of, well, why can't that person learn or why can't? And I'm thinking, no, that they're learning and they're going to be bilingual, our, mm -hmm. our students. Yeah. And then I also have had conversations where I've talked to other adults and have said, it's harder to learn a language the older you get. Oh, yeah, yeah most definitely. So how can we expect adults coming from different countries to walk into the United oh, States yeah. and learn English? English. Yeah, they even right say, away. if you want a kid to learn a language, you have to teach them while right. they're still well, young. Exactly. And then it will get implemented in their head perfectly. Yes. But when you get older, right, it's And you're difficult. coming to the U.S. and most likely need to work at least one job, if not more, again, depending on financial status. And when are you going to take lessons? Now, we do offer, and I've substitute taught for adults as English as a second language um, classes and often the adults are coming with maybe anywhere from a degree and from the country in which they're coming from to sometimes being a store owner a lawyer but don't have the language and we don't have in the United States a program that is going to offer you know reciprocity where if you're a lawyer in Guatemala you mm -hmm. can be a lawyer in the United States mm -hmm. you have to take the test in English and so I think that we white people <laughs> need to continue to educate ourselves because you know my family came from Europe three or four 
um, what do I want to say? Like my great great grandfather. Generations. Thank you, generations. <laughs> yes, <laughs> generations um, ago. So at one point, my family was immigrating mm-hmm. immigrants, yeah. unless you're First Nation Indigenous. Mm-hmm. Um, so I do think it's so important that we, as educators, we who identify as white, um, we do the education, um, take the you know, more trainings, et cetera, with working with our students. Um, so thank you for letting me yeah. <laughs> share that part. I, I think of the one that did like you and all the ESL teachers, I appreciate you guys a lot because it's it's a lot. There's so many ELL like students in, in Westboro High and it's really like just four teachers, you know. Mm-hmm. And wow. I think the other teachers for like history, math, which are not ELL ones, they just mm-hmm. like, you know, re- I say regular teachers, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, mainstream. Yeah, main, main mainstream teachers. teachers. They yeah. they not prepare, you know. Like I got out of the ELL after a year and a half with a lot of effort. Uh, but when I did, like my, like, how do I say the regular in English? Like oh, general regular. education, yeah. or do you mean the co- your core classes? Yeah, like, because I got out of the ELL. Went Into the mainstream English class with yeah, everybody, so inclu- inclu- with inclusive. Inclusive. Yeah, and so when I got there, like, she kind of expected me to be just like any other American mm-hmm. student, which was very hard for me because, like, they, they learn English their whole life, you know. Right. And then, like, it was harder for me. I always had, like, C's or, like, I couldn't get to the, you know, mm-hmm. everywhere. Like, like I, I don't know how to say that. I'm sorry. To earn, like, a B or an A. Yeah, it was way harder for me. Yes, right. Yeah. And then... And I really like that you guys bring that up, that like, for example, like um, Mrs. Stoker brought up that like being, um, you could be a lawyer, you can have education back in your country, but the only thing that's like setting a barrier from you bringing that over in here is just that language. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really big misconception that people uh, tend to like think that people who come from a different um, country are less smart or they're dumber, whatever Mm -hmm. it is, because they just don't speak that same language. When in reality, so many people from other countries, like for example, like so many uh, concepts that we now teach are like originated from mm-hmm. other countries, right? And yeah. like just because you have a degree in another country but it's not the same language does not mean that you're not as educated as somebody here in America. I also mm-hmm. wanted to mention how, as you said, like you know, adults try to learn English. I feel like that, like once they come here, that like they have like very, like, like they don't style, I don't know. like little options mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. they have to take out the job. Oh, I can't work there because I don't speak English. Right. I have to work here because it'll be much. I won't be able to talk to the coworkers mm-hmm. because I don't. You know, like you know, right? You, you, they usually choose jobs where they don't have to interact as much because they wouldn't have to use English. Right. Mm-hmm. There's another thing I wanted to say is like about feeling number. Like uh, in back in Brazil. Like Portuguese and math were, and history was, were like my favorite like subjects mm-hmm. ever. And here I couldn't get like good grades. I was getting like very frustrated mm. because like it's not the same language. It's not like you know my first language. And like math, um, I went from like pre calc to like uh, algebra two, algebra one, and then like I don't I don't believe I was in the right level, mm-hmm. you know, because I think it was too easy for me. But they kept me on the like the easiest level just mm. because English was not like my first language, and also chemistry. I was in the easiest one. Uh, of course, English, I was in the easiest one, of course, but like all the other ones, I don't think I should have been like brought back, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, made me feel very, he's more in the, very dumb in the class. I, know. What's it, I wanted to say, like history here, it's different from we learn Brazil, because the history we learn here, it's like, Completely American different. Yeah. Brazil's yeah. history, so mm-hmm. yeah. it, it, it changes. And like you were saying, Larissa, about the languages, um, when I moved here from Worcester, I was I was put into an ESL class. Mm-hmm. And I spoke English fine, but it was because that they saw that I spoke Portuguese and that I spoke Spanish that they put me in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. How did that feel, Daphne? Um, definitely uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, I did get out of the program after like a year, mm-hmm. but... It definitely made me feel like I was dumb and that mm. they viewed me as dumb because of my culture. Right. When really you were trilingual. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Which is, which is and that's a flaw of the educational yeah. system. And I'll say, obviously, we in Westboro have a lot of work to do. And this is across the U.S. educational system as mm. well. I remember one of my math teachers in middle school told me that, you know, it's honestly a blessing knowing two languages because he told me he when you're older he told me this specific specific situation 
let's say you're applying for a job, you told me. Mm-hmm. You know two languages, and there's another pl- person that knows one. They're going to choose you over mm-hmm. the, that one person that knows one language as you know more as if they were had a customer that knew the Spanish, because mm-hmm. I know Spanish, they would come to you. Yeah, Absolutely. there are a lot of people that got, just, that got hired at Chick-fil-A on the spot just because they knew Spanish or mm-hmm. Portuguese or Arabic, actually like any yeah. other language, just because they know it comes in right. handy because they know their customer base is not just right. one race and just to be more inclusive, Absolutely. you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Inclusion versus divide. I can at least for say for myself in sixth grade when Colonial Day first came up and people were talking about what they're gonna dress up as, you know, a lot of the white boys, or at least in the photos that they were showing, were dressing up in these hats and these tops that it looked like a lot of th- what the colonists wore and I'm like well I can't dress up as that first of all I'm a woman second of all I'm black so I don't know how I'm supposed to dress up as this like colonial Columbus thing exactly. going on so I chose to dress up as a Native American but even that day I could just see like I could feel divide mm-hmm. obviously we're all younger so we don't under so it's not necessarily divide where it's like oh this is weird but it's oh you're dressing up as that and I'm dressing up as this and in history you were actually conquering and overpowering and oppressing natives, you know? I'm not even native, but I was dressing up as one because mm-hmm. that's what I felt like I could when it came to my skin color. And I was just wondering what you guys felt like when we did that event at school. I felt like I chose native because I felt like I suited it more than white because I just like said, you know what? I look more Native American. At the time, I didn't even know that my country even had Native Americans, you know. It's different from, like, the United States America, uh, Native Americans um, than it is over there. But I only chose it because I just said, you know what, I don't feel comfortable really dressing up as, like, a white pilgrim or whatever. Oh, yeah, so, pilgrim, that's the word. <laughs> <laughs> so I just said, you know what, I'm a, I have to dress up as a pilgrim. I got my little American girl doll, the little Native American, too. So I honestly just, like... Yeah, I thought, honestly, I'd never had the, the thought, like, um, about how, like, they honestly kind of forced it on us. Yeah. Especially, yeah, it was like, either dressed yeah, it was either like, dressed like that or this. Or and it was dress, strict, yeah. too. It was like, you're coming up dressed I'm not going to lie. Mm-hmm. I did dress up as a fuck. <laughs> 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 no, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. You were yeah. good. You were no, good. Here's yeah. the thing, too. The thing that I feel like the main reason why is because sometimes they did wear, like, a headscarf. So I wore a headscarf that day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and But it was, like, it wasn't, like, the hijab. It was more, like, just, like, tied, like, mm-hmm. around the neck and stuff like that. So I have a picture, too, and I, like, look back on it. I'm like, why did we even do that? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, like, it wasn't really that, like, historical. I get it. Yeah. It was, like, Thanksgiving and stuff like that, but it's... But it in wasn't reality, yeah. beautiful or Yeah, but even like in reality, that. that's not what Thanksgiving was about. Exactly. You know, they stole resources, and they basically just mm-hmm. stole the land from them and claimed mm-hmm. it as their own, and they got the praise for something that they didn't even actually win, Honestly. you know? Mm-hmm. And, but like, it's turned out where we are right now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I feel like we can all say maybe we didn't feel divide that day, but at least for me, I didn't feel super uncomfortable, but I was like, this is just weird, you know? Mm-hmm. Even now when I look back, when people were bringing in guns, I I was like, oh, wow, like, that was, that's weird. You guys don't remember for that? For Colonial they or? Colonial Day. Like, they didn't bring in literal guns. Right, right. But the kind of <laughs> pistols they used. I, or they shot muskets. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. that. Not like, not like, <laughs> no, not like, like 22. No. I don't remember um, the day so clear. Like, I remember it happening, but I don't know. Yeah. But no, 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 we were young, yeah. and it was like, I just remember, like, either dress as this or dress as that, and it was. But no, all I'm saying is, like, if I was doing at this age, I would be like, why the hell are we doing this? Like, yeah. I didn't grow up here, but in Brazil, we had kind of this, like, kind of similar thing, because we were colonized by like the Portuguese people they were like white you know and then if you like I don't know if you guys know but in Brazil was the last uh, country in the world to abolish slavery Mm -hmm. one of the worst like slavery we ever had in Mm -hmm. the whole world you know and like I was growing up like we had the Independence Day and all that and and we just see those white guys and they were there in this had like They're portrayed statues as like of them, heroes, yeah, yeah. As heroes mm-hmm. and oh, yeah, most but they don't show the bad part and what they did with like all the indigenous people that we we have exactly, a lot in Brazil yeah. too, mm-hmm. and then the also like you know yeah the even yeah people, even yeah. in history you can see a lot of that white savior complex mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. They're yeah, the yeah hero we have in they did that yeah. and you know like right. glorifying yes like, yes yeah. mm-hmm. yes mm-hmm. but I can at least say even like you said Daphne earlier the World Cup happened and they had TVs showing all of 
the games. And you mm -hmm. know, the World Cup is diverse. There's countries all over the world. Yeah. And I could definitely see that there was an inclusion and togetherness and appreciation of cultures mm -hmm. throughout those weeks. Because these were different countries from Africa and Asia and Europe and South America and everything. And everyone was just watching it together, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was this past, past year. Yeah, yeah, like where it usually it. happens in the summer. I I think it was it was a great experience to have it like during the school year, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, everyone was wearing like the country or the the jerseys of their countries, and everyone was kind of watching the games together and celebrating together. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of the first time I kind of saw that celebration of like cultures and countries in a while at school. Yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. it's unfortunate that there's months like Black History Month, which is this month, mm -hmm. or Hispanic Heritage Month, and we're not able to get that same vibe and feel of appreciation for each other when it comes to months that advocate for us the most mm -hmm. worldwide, you know? Mm -hmm. Especially, like, those months are, like, not really, like, uh, how do you say, as popular, you know? Like, mm -hmm. again, like, I don't know if I mentioned this, like, I think I have. Uh, I didn't even know there was a, a Latino, like, mm -hmm. appreciation, like, yeah. Hispanic, anything like that. And so I remember, like, what, a couple years ago, I, saw, I went to the library, and there's just, like, I see these, like, Hispanic and Heritage Month, and I was just, like, girl what like <laughs> like i did not even know like i was like when has when was this yeah. like ever like mm -hmm. when, have, when why haven't i heard this about this earlier like mm -hmm. it's just like i feel like we never get taught that um as younger in europe nor black history month yeah. yeah it's just like it's usually right now it's the time to appreciate what these type of like uh, ethnicities have been through mm -hmm. especially the black community you know yeah Especially of what what yeah. they suffered in this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. I think like in Westport, we don't really have a like in our high school, we don't really have the that space to be proud of our culture mm -hmm. and really like have time to appreciate it and talk exactly, about it and talk yeah. about it. Like like I mentioned before about the Spirit Week, yeah. they have the U.S. Day and like all those Hawaiian days, but we never have anything that could like. Oh, but what about all my friends that are from different places or their parents? We yeah, never, that could really empower like yeah. a good port, a good percentage of the school. Actually, it would, you know. Mm -hmm. And I know we're gonna go into this like a little bit deeper in uh, hopefully our next episode. So, um, but one of the things that I really did see is like. Um, other countries or other people from other countries supporting other countries when it came to like World Cup oh, or yeah, like most those definitely. kind of yeah. activities and that's mm -hmm. something that I really like to see because even if it's not like a, a white person supporting a uh, somebody mm -hmm. from another country yeah. it's also nice to see countries supporting other countries exactly. like yeah. for example like with Morocco like there was yeah, a bunch yeah. of that like unity. The, yeah that unity it's so nice to see mm -hmm. and like it just like it creates kind of sort of a bond with other countries yeah exactly mm -hmm. I definitely wish that I've sure all of you guys have seen on TikTok cultural day where people dress up in their ethnic clothing and bring food from their background and just bond over that you know because I think where we come from does hold some part of our own identity and mm -hmm. I wish that's some that's something that West Rose schools would do mm -hmm. uh, yeah. or even replace colonial day with that because yeah. they know most definitely that mm -hmm. if they were doing that event in high school a lot of people would have done would have there would have been a committee bill to talk yeah. to the principal about why we're doing this, mm -hmm. you right. know? Also, like, for, like, Definitely. the uh, Black History Month, and uh, put something up. Like, honestly, like, yeah. appreciate the people that you have here because it's starting to get more uh, diverse. Yes, exactly. Like, you need to, like, uh, you need to let these people stop hiding because, honestly, like, not showing us in school, especially that we are in school for, like, 13, 12, what, 12 13 years, mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. get taught nothing until, until we're older and we finally can understand, like, we don't want like any other person like another kid to go through that we want them to learn and embrace themselves mm -hmm. like we did like the, like we are right now exactly. and it's definitely gotten better like throughout the oh, years yeah, of course now that we're like creating groups like this to like bring awareness about it i think it's definitely gotten better than like when i was a lot younger and there's oh, more yeah. awareness and i'm hoping that in the future there can be even more and like people can just it, it's not even something that you really notice it's just everybody has their own race and you're seeing past it and it's more about who you are as a person rather than what where you, you come like, from yeah. exactly mm -hmm. and it's good that we're building this like safe space to like the the kids that are going to go to westport high school in the future and they're going to see all these projects that we've done and like the, these great talks that you know because mm -hmm. we didn't have that when we were kids or like when we yeah. got here you know yeah safe and brave space yeah. and you're all very brave and courageous Thank you. Yeah, I just because we were made. Oh, I'm so yeah. sorry. No, you're <laughs> we were, okay. Because we were made to be brave, honestly. Yeah. Especially mm -hmm. everything. So we were thankful made. for you. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Likewise. 
Yeah. But yeah, I just wanted to thank all of you for ha for coming here and for us having this conversation. And thank you as well, because I didn't even know about yeah. this like until like a couple months ago. And like once now that I like started coming and stuff, I feel like it's like a re it was a really good decision. Yeah, I'm really glad Daphne was like, come on, let's join. Yeah. <laughs> but all of you are helping build it, and I hope that this program can also expand in the high school. Yes, yeah. I really hope so too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us for the WLC Connect Club first broadcast conversation. This is Larissa Labre and Daphne Cabrera reporting for the WLC Connect Club from Studio 33 at Westboro TV.